it's my very great pleasure to welcome Alison Brisk, the Medisham Professor of Global Governance in the Department of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, she's currently, she hasn't come all the way over from the States this morning. She's currently a Fulbright visiting professor at Oxford Pembroke College in the Department of Politics and International Relations. Uh, she's an American political scientist who's authored seven books and edited 10 more books on international human rights. And she's been a scholar and lecturer in Argentina, Australia, Ecuador, France, Spain, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, South Africa, and Japan. Wow. <laughs> she's also held Fulbright fellowships in India and Canada, and she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses on human rights, international relations, civil society, and Latin American politics. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome her here. And today she's going to talk about reproductive rights at risk. And I, I just paused from what I was going to say that in my 20s, I never imagined that uh, reproductive rights would be at risk in the United Kingdom. They were at least not in Northern Ireland. I wasn't living in Northern Ireland then. I think they were not available, but in England, uh, they were certainly available and nobody ever imagined they'd be at risk. Um, but they are now at risk and um, to me, it's very disturbing. So I'm very pleased to have Alison here to talk about um, what is happening in the struggle to protect those rights. She'll be exploring the social patterns and political process of the struggle for reproductive rights in Europe and the Americas, Ireland, Poland, Argentina, Brazil, and the US. And particularly as we, I'm sure many of you are well aware, the US faces the prospect of the loss of national judicial protection for the right to abortion under Roe and Wade. And uh, she will be discussing how the lessons of human rights scholarship and comparative experience inform re reproductive rights advocacy and mobilization. So it's very, my very great pleasure to welcome Alison Brisk. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I want to especially thank the Transitional Justice Institute, Ulster University, uh, Queen's University is uh, also sponsoring part of my visit here, um, and uh, Claire, who <laughs> helped arrange everything. Um, and um, it's uh, just a wonderful opportunity for me to be here and exchange. Um, I'm certainly going to present information that I've been gathering and analysis that I have been uh, looking at, but uh, I'm, I am also here to exchange and to learn from your experience. Um, so as was mentioned, I have over a generation of experience analyzing the patterns of human rights and struggles for human rights, um, usually from the perspective of a political process combining pressures from above and below, from social movements and global institutions and norms, um, increasingly as the years go by and as I've gone across a different set of issues from uh, my original work was on transitional justice. Uh, I've looked at indigenous people's rights in Latin America. I've looked at some globalized threats to gender rights um, in terms of human trafficking and contemporary slavery and uh, women's rights. Um, but I increasingly circle back to the role of the state and of national level political processes. Um, and uh, in 2018, I completed a project on some global patterns of gender violence. And um, it was in the aftermath of that project and watching recent developments um, since 2018 and that have accelerated during the pandemic. I have a, a small article coming out in the Journal of Human Rights called Pandemic Patriarchy that looks at some of the gendered impacts and interdependent threats to different kinds of women's rights, women's human rights, crossing over from labor and social rights to health and reproductive rights to violence and, and gender issues. Um, and there's a, a special issue of the Journal of Human Rights on COVID and, and the impact on human rights. Anyway, in that process, I began thinking ever more about reproductive rights. And then um, I was used to thinking about Latin America. I had begun to think about Europe. 
and within the US, I began to see slippage in that pattern. Um, and as was, was mentioned. Um, so we start off with a kind of global chronicle of struggles and campaigns for reproductive rights, um, starting from the, from the top uh, in Argentina, where we see the symbolism of the, the headscarf, which started out with my own origins of my uh, academic research career in Argentina in the aftermath of transitional justice, the mothers of the disappeared, a gendered human rights movement using the headscarves to symbolize their struggle. And now those headscarves have turned green and green is the symbolic color of um, the reproductive rights struggle across Latin America. <clears throat> so you will also see down in the bottom um, a very interesting symbolic representation from Mexico um, of a woman who has painted her, her expectant belly <laughs> with um, uh, the phrase uh, uh, voluntary maternity, willful motherhood. That's, you know, so it really epitomizes <clears throat> the self-determination struggle and um, the, uh, the struggle for bodily autonomy and that she has her child with her, um, who I believe is masked for COVID purposes. I don't, I don't think the child is, um, you know, a gorilla or anything like that. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> and then some of the other cases um, in my comparative work, which I'll get to in a moment, um, so uh, in Latin America, I'm looking at the divergence between reproductive rights progress in Argentina and regress in Brazil. These are places I had already looked at other human rights issues and was struck by this changing pattern. Um, in Europe, I was struck by the divergence between Ireland uh, and Poland. And so of course, I have those two cases highlighted. And then just recently, the uh, the photo from the US with the Washington Monument in the background there. Um, not only keep abortion legal, so not only a, a civil rights struggle of self-determination, but we are the majority. And the puzzle for me as an American political scientist who has looked at cases all over the world that we have a majority that is being systematically disempowered on this issue and how that happens and what it looks like in the context of democratic backsliding worldwide. So um, first of all, just to start, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this framework, um, but perhaps not all. Um, so reproductive rights are the politics of sexual self-determination over reproduction and the right to health. And we do now have international uh, norms, rulings, references, particularly picking up since the mid 2000 teens from CEDAW, the uh, International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, um, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, where we have rulings and commissions that, that identify uh, various levels of rights to reproductive self-determination, to health, um, and that really state that uh, not just freedom, but access to safe abortion is a human right. It is there in the international norms. Um, and particularly, there's a very critical statement in 2018 of the UN Office of High uh, Commission of Human Rights. Um, in terms of the, the worldwide impact, the World Health Organization estimates there are at least 200 uh, sorry, 22 million unsafe abortions each year that lead to at least documented 47,000 deaths. And this constitutes 13% of maternal deaths and is the third largest cause of maternal mortality globally. Um, and we look at the SDGs, the um, Sustainable Development Goals, you know, the, the, the biggest worldwide consensus um, and maternal mortality is a, is a key element of that and is linked to all kinds of other interdependent human rights and, and social conditions. Um, in terms of the growth of restrictions and backlash, there's a particularly egregious pattern that has developed in Central America in which El Salvador has been arresting, has arrested dozens of women for miscarriages. 
Um, they are considered by Amnesty International, for example, to be political prisoners. Um, there are 17 still jailed, and there are some similar things taking place uh, in Ecuador and Nicaragua, and this is a, a strategy. Um, and of course, we have seen the deaths of abortion seekers in Ireland, Poland, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. Um, the El Salvador case led to not only social protest, but a legal ruling by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Now, pulling back to the sort of social science perspective, um, we, I've looked at a lot of literature about what we see as overall the drivers of the outcomes of reproductive rights. We have general sense of uh, the drivers of human rights and you know, democratization, civil liberties, expansion of women's rights, and they generally break down into some economic, political, and um, identity or social dynamics. So um, the standing explanations for all kinds, the expansion or regression of all kinds of um, reproductive rights, um, including contraception and uh, maternal health care and all these other things, um, are either a sort of color-coded green for economics, um, uh, you know, money, sex, power, and God, economic modernization. There's a general worldwide trend that economic development improves support law policy for all forms of fertility control and self-determination because there are increasing positive returns to women's education and labor force participation. That's a generic global modernization pattern. Um, and slightly modifying that pattern, the level of social inequality and uh, lower uh, human development outcomes. So your, your national development income could be rising, but if you have an extremely unequal society, um, that will tend to uh, mitigate any kind of positive impact on any form of human rights. So, and that is kind of um, be, uh, giving you the hint here, the Brazil story, right? Uh, or, you know, India or something, you know, there are certain countries where we can see that pullback effect. Um, in terms of political development, again, it's a fairly common sense story. More democratic regimes, more left-leaning regimes tend to have better outcomes on health and women's rights of all sorts. Um, generally more globalized countries, there's a measurable global diffusion of international treaties, networks, and health frames. Um, and um, actually, in a kind of ironic or interesting feature is that there are some studies, um, Elizabeth Boyle, for example, uh, on the spread of abortion rights that um, uh, where we have greater empowerment of health rights in general, um, over and above rights struggles, where we have greater participation of medical professionals in campaigns for reproductive rights, we tend to have more advanced outcomes. Um, and of course, within democracies um, and within progressive regimes, women's political partic participation and the influence of feminist movements are generally associated with expansions of reproductive rights. Really no surprises here, but it's good to note and to see where we may be looking for exceptions or uh, contradictions of this general model. Um, now, of course, uh, there are also identity elements and social elements that we need to look at. Um, so along with democratization and development, uh, the spread of liberal modernity in attitudes and the what is called by public opinion and political science, um, you know, the Norris and Englehart kind of uh, world value survey model, they talk about a rising tide of gender liberalism, uh, which tends to lead to expansions of uh, women's rights of all sorts. Um, on the other hand, there is um, this famous Hatun and Weldon book called The Logics of Gender Justice that breaks down different kinds of women's rights and says, you know, labor rights aren't going to follow the same patterns as reproductive rights. There are going to be different clusters of actors, different coalitions that we need to look at to understand where things advance. Um, and they actually pull back and say, you know, reproductive rights is where we're always going to see a lag because they don't follow the economic logic, the political logic, 
you know, feminist empowerment alone is never going to get us there on reproductive rights because they are doctrinal politics that depend on church state relations. Um, uh, and their work is based, uh, it's worldwide, but they, they started out in Latin America and I think they're heavily influenced by that. Um, now, what has been unevenly studied and where I really come in stronger is to look at nationalism um, and nationalist, the influence of nationalist parties, nationalist attitudes. Um, and what I want to emphasize here is that, you know, to some extent this comes out of feminist theory and trying to bridge um, feminist theory about nationalism and control of reproduction um, with the kind of empirical study of reproductive policies and outcomes um, and population politics. Um, and there are some feminist studies that are of course historical and case studies, but there hasn't been a lot of empirical and, and bringing this together. And I want to say that when I say nationalism, <laughs> um, uh, there is a big literature on civic versus ethnic nationalism. And I think we have ways to distinguish ethno-nationalism and particularly the contemporary resurgence of ethno-nationalism where it had been fading. Um, and that I suspect is of particular relevance for this location. Um, so I have two pieces of research already developing and one in progress that speak to this question of the differential influence of nationalism, ethno-nationalism on reproductive rights outcomes and why we might be seeing regression in some places, despite the development and modernization political dynamics that would, we would expect to be leading to liberalization worldwide. First of all, I have an edited project standing on the shoulders of my giant contributors who study different countries. Um, so this is an edited volume and my chapters on Poland, Brazil, Turkey, and the Philippines each note this incredible association between nationalist populism, nationalist populist leaders and regimes and backlash, patriarchal backlash on all forms of women's rights and particularly that a culture war over reproductive rights. Um, so that's sort of a, a global context. Um, then I have another paper article in process uh, in which uh, co-authored with a, a graduate student who runs some heavy duty numbers on, on this. Um, we look at from, uh, some of you may be familiar with the World Value Survey. We look at the European Value Survey uh, where there is very good data on individuals' abortion attitudes. There's also, there are questions on nationalism. There are four different questions. This has never been analyzed together. And we take, we pick apart the civic patriotic nationalism and we look at two questions, one of which is about ancestry ethno-nationalism and another is about distrust of foreigners. And we have the individual level regression data that we find that over and above the usual factors of religiosity and gender liberalism, that an individual's ethno-nationalism and xenophobia it makes a significant, statistically significant and politically significant difference in their abortion attitudes. What I'm depicting here is the country level because it is a little more visually powerful. And you can see that association within Europe. Um, so what my own work in progress is, as I mentioned from the photos on the slides, to look at some sets of contrasting cases, uh, to look at Argentina versus Brazil, Ireland versus Poland, and the US versus itself, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so as I've been developing knowledge and history and modeling these cases based on some of the factors that we 
uh, know about from some of the theories that I mentioned. Um, I, my own model is that what we are seeing is a kind of competing equation of um, countries that have been on that globalizing, modernizing, democratizing pathway in every case, right? That in which globalization has had different impacts and therefore there has been either a resurgence of nationalism, a development of nationalism, a modification of the relationship between nationalism and religious influences. Something has happened with nationalism and we are used to looking at religion and the doctrinal politics, but in my view, what I'm seeing in these cases is that it's uh, these, the four here are all Catholic, all with traditionally strong influence of the Catholic church on reproductive rights policies. And yet they've come to very different outcomes. Um, and um, in some cases there is, I think also a filtering influence. So I think it's all about nationalism and what has changed and shifted in nationalism. Uh, but I also think that feminist movements um, play another critical role. So those two factors, I think, and the balance between them is where I see the change coming about. Um, and um, the, I have some more statistics on these cases in a bonus slide if we get to it, but I don't want to go too long because I want to leave time for questions. Uh, and I also want to talk about the U.S. in a minute. Um, so just to, just to quickly outline, um, so the, and the abortion outcome, that's a coding that um, I work on this woman's stats project, and we have information about the rights and conditions of women across about 100 indicators. And um, so the level of abortion rights, you know, ones and threes, it's a four point scale. Um, okay. So um, in terms of globalization, and um, I'm looking broadly at globalization, but of course we are all thinking about the, uh, the action coming from the impact of neoliberal economic globalization. Um, and I am not certainly not endorsing that, I am just observing <laughs> how it has an impact on political systems and um, the possibilities of coalitions and mentalities and ideologies. Um, so in uh, Braz Brazil and Argentina have not been happy campers, shall we say, in terms of neoliberal globalization. They have both suffered losses in national income. They have both had increases in inequality, but the impact has been much worse in Brazil. And um, there was this uh, pink tide of somewhat social democratic leadership across Latin America that, that crashed dramatically in Brazil, um, being replaced by Bolsonaro, one of the fiercest um, authoritarian populist leaders. He refers to himself, as you may know, as the Trump of the tropics. Um, yeah, <laughs> proudly. Um, and um, uh, the other thing that happens in Brazil is that um, this is to some extent a doctrinal politics story, but it is not, I repeat, not a Catholic church influence story because Catholic church is declining in population and influence in Brazil. And in fact, evangelical Christians are now almost a third of the population. And the statistic you see on the religious influence column there is, um, from a, a Pew Research survey about what proportion of the national population rates religion as very important in their lives. So how religious are people? I mean, it doesn't matter what the label of their religion is. Do they care? Do they act politically on behalf of their religion? Well, 72% of Brazil, it's one of the highest statistics recorded worldwide. Um, and um, now Brazil, uh, tragically has had a, a, a very empowered women's movement and they made tremendous progress into until about 2010, uh, but they have been kind of on the ropes, on the defensive um, and have really lost political space for reasons we can discuss. The contrasting neighboring country of Argentina 
um, though they've suffered from neoliberal economic globalization, they have nationalistically, they have retained a certain level of uh, self-determination in their response. And so the political perception is that they have defied the forces of neoliberal globalization. For example, they've defaulted on their debt numerous times. Um, in Argentina, it is one of the sharpest declines in the political influence of the Catholic Church, um, uh, in part because that church was extremely complicit with the military dictatorship and has been quite delegitimated. Um, now, what's interesting is Argentina has one of the oldest populist nationalist movements in Latin America, but that movement, precisely because it is quite historic, has gone through several waves and has revamped itself. And the current wave of the Peronist movement is quite outward looking um, and, very, and very avid participant in Latin American regional organizations, um, in proposing human rights measures at the United Nations and sees itself that nationalism has turned and become the promotion of international human rights and not a withdrawal and defensiveness. Um, in terms of the women's movement, uh, there, the women's movement um, has remained empowered in Argentina. They have sort of um, historic political capital because of their strong association with the human rights movement that fostered the democratic transition. Whereas the women's movement in Brazil was relatively disconnected from the human rights movement properly seen. And as part of that movement, um, they got gender quotas. And so uh, the Argentine legislature is now 40% female. Um, there are some similar contrasts I would point to, um, you know, in, in uh, Poland, the post-socialist decline, uh, you know, Europeanization as a, an economically negative force, um, and associated with that, both continuing out migration, which has switched in, in Ireland, uh, and a very low fertility rate, so that one can legitimately point to a kind of demographic defensiveness in terms of reproductive rights. Um, certainly there is here the fusion of religious forces with nationalism, um, dating, of course, from the resistance to communism. So the church has that pre-ordained, if I may, uh, nationalist role. Um, and for Europe, uh, a, a very high, 40% say religion is very important. Um, again, contrast with Ireland. Um, um, contrasting responses um, of nationalism. Um, again, I, I think roughly, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, the transformation in Ireland of an, from similar to Argentina, somewhat parallel, from an inward looking nationalism to an outward looking nationalism, where to be nationalist, to defend the national interest is to participate more internationally. Um, and of course, like Argentina, a rising women's movement, uh, including political, significant political empowerment um, and peace movement legacies lending extra strength and political weight to the women's movement. Okay, <laughs> that was quick. Uh, let's turn to the US. Um, so for those of you just to kind of uh, fill in on, on the, the current state of play in the US. Um, so as was mentioned, we are about to lose the uh, sole standard of abortion rights. So abortion rights in the US depend solely and entirely on a Supreme Court ruling from 1973 Roe versus Wade that states that there can be no interference before viability, fetal viability. Um, uh, and notice also that the standard there is privacy. So in other countries, the argument is made as a self-determination issue, it's made as a health issue, um, it's made as a discrimination issue, and um, many of us have been nervous about this for a while. Um, notice also that, uh, again, we do not have a law, we do not have 
any other federal standard. Um, we have also had um, constant undermining of access to this right by cuts in funding, the, Hyde, the infamous Hyde Amendment that has cut Medicaid funding, as you may recall, we don't have a national healthcare system, but we do have some supplementary funding uh, for poor women. And uh, the Hyde Amendment has on and off over the years always blocked poor women from using their federal health funds for access to abortion. Uh, we also have prior to Roe bans and trigger laws in place already in the following states. Um, from the 1990s on, certain states have been, despite the Roe versus Wade standard, uh, using different mechanisms to block access to abortion, including imposing waiting periods, funding limitations um, of national, uh, I'm sorry, of state level health insurance funds, particularly since we did get Obamacare, but there are lots of state limitations um, on access to that. And um, um, undermining clinic access and the operation of clinics by um, creating bizarre regulations of what, how clinics must operate and the standards they may meet which leads to what are, we are calling abortion deserts where there are states where you would have to drive 500 miles, 600 miles to get an abortion. And then if there's a waiting period and you're required to go twice and you are a young mother or working person, a person who doesn't have many resources, this effectively blocks you um, from, from getting an abortion. Um, now, since the 2010s, above and beyond that, and of course, most recently, um, we have had a wave of state regulations which are leading to the current challenges to Roe versus Wade. Those tend to involve gestational age, so this whole viability standard is being challenged. Viability would be, you know, 24, 26 weeks. Um, um, exemptions for, for example, rape, incest, um, in, and enforcement mechanisms. So the, the state level, those of you who are law or rights campaigners will be will need want to be aware that this is the shape of these new state restrictions. Um, so the the case that is challenging Roe v. Wade is in Mississippi, that's Dobbs versus Jackson, and that creates a standard of 15 weeks. Um, in Florida and Arizona, they have also drafted those uh, with impetus from Republican governors and there's particular politics there. Um, of course, the infamous Texas law, six weeks, um, which also introduces private prosecution. Um, uh, that means that individuals can report and gain financial benefit from turning in their neighbors and friends. Um, in Oklahoma, they've passed the most drastic law yet. It has not yet gone through legal challenges. Um, that uh, forbids abortion from conception with no exceptions. And in Missouri, they've had an interesting mechanism where they have forbidden travel for abortion, which surely must violate other aspects of individual liberties, but um, okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, I, uh, in, my, in my teaching and my previous research, I've always kind of checked back in every kind of rights I've looked at and said, you know, are we seeing American exceptionalism? Is there anything we can learn from worldwide patterns um, that can help us to understand the state of play of rights in the US? Um, so uh, the, the top set are kind of structural factors and the bottom are the more norms, identity um, factors that we talked about when we looked at the models at the beginning, right? So the economic, political structures, legal structures, um, and um, the kind of summarizing, I'm trying to speed up a little here. Uh, if you look at, for example, the influence of international regimes, that generally tends to be positive and it is um, exceptional, but not outside the model, that the US pays no attention to international law in almost any way. Um, 
possibly commercially, some, some trade law has, has an impact. Um, we haven't even signed CEDAW, for example. Um, so, so, you know, from a social science perspective, this is good news. Yes, the model works. From a political perspective, of course, it's terrible um, because it means that in order to promote rights in the US, we would have to entirely change the relationship between the US and uh, legal and political globalization, which is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, some people say, oh, it's federalism is the problem, but no, federalism is actually a positive factor in Mexico and Argentina. Um, so again, from an analytic perspective, that's not where we really need to, to focus. Um, in terms of um, this nervousness, we don't have a law, we only have one judicial decision. Um, certainly it was by judicial decision that Poland regressed and um, certainly it was having a richer legislative and political input structure in Ireland. The referendum, of course, was, was how there was progress there. So that is something we'd want to look at. And certainly we have some uh, political parties working systematically to undermine rights in Poland and the US. So that is also something we'd want to look at. And I'm going to just float over. We can talk in the questions. But some of the um, kind of deeper analysis that's coming out right now in the US is really pointing to the influence of political party coalitions on judicial nominations that they adopted systematic long-term strategy um, of promoting judicial nominations and uh, campaign spending laws and patterns. Um, and the campaign spending is probably exceptional to the US, but the judicial nominations is something we might all want to keep an eye on, depending on our political systems. Okay, now looking at the norms, um, I talked about ethno-nationalism in Europe. Um, we can see it, of course, in Latin America, different in different ways. Um, what does that look like in the US? It looks like race, right? That's what nationalism is in the US is race. Um, I have a slide coming that will uh, look at that. Um, certainly um, something I'm worrying about in the US is that the US has as strong a feminist movement and has had as much protest as Ireland or Argentina. The, the feminist movement is not discredited and in fact was relatively resilient in the Trump years to other kinds of challenges. So I'm, I'm a bit puzzled and concerned about that. Uh, where I think the answer is analytically is the strength of the counter movement. And the counter movement um, in the US is even stronger than the counter movements we see in Poland and Brazil. And that counter movement has become transnational as some of you may be aware. Um, uh, I do, in terms of frames and appeals, I talked about that before, but in terms of public opinion, something that's interesting to note is that we do have that contradiction that the sign pointed to, that um, about two thirds of the American public favors little or no restriction on abortion rights. Um, and it is not just uh, an overly empowered minority pushing this issue, in my view. The thing that I really have begun to look at is that about a third of the US public is entirely politically disengaged. Not only do they not vote, they don't know what Roe versus Wade is. The, the level of I don't know, I don't care on opinion polls is really alarming on this, this issue and many rights related issues in the US. Um, so <laughs> here is my take on what ethno-nationalism looks like in the US. Now, um, in the bottom half of the slide, um, around the 2016 election of Trump, uh, there were people who revived some um, sense of historical continuities in the politics of race in the US. And so the, uh, the 1860 map here is not only of slavery, the red states of course are the Confederacy, but um, the, the gray zones here are 
areas in which different levels of slavery were allowed under a set of compromises and special arrangements. Um, and so the blue states on that map are the blue states in terms of political affiliation, um, what, 160 years later. Um, that shows up in the election of 2016. It also shows up in the state by state breakdown. So the upper left is abortion availability in the US by gestational age and what we're about to face, which is slightly worse, um, <laughs> pretty much the same, but slightly worse, um, which is where there are states that have uh, trigger bans and pre-row legislation that's going to come back. Um, and um, you will see remarkable confluence among these maps. Um, so the conclusion or the take home here is uh, what can we say about defending rights at risk and the strategy versus the structures of what we're seeing in these comparative patterns? Um, so throughout all those issues I've looked at before, um, you know, it's, this is kind of the revisiting the uh, conventional wisdom we've developed over a generation of human rights studies. Uh, all rights depend on a combination of consciousness and frames and appeals, mobilization campaigns and coalitions, pressures from above and below the state, law, but also access and empowerment, um, policy implementation and institutionalization. And when we're dealing with women's rights or gendered issues, we have additional layers to overcome of private wrongs. Um, that is, uh, you know, issues that depend upon non-state actors and the human rights regime wasn't fully designed for that. Um, intersectional inequities uh, in gender, race, class, disability and other uh, migration status um, that are particularly uh, complex to overcome. Um, and the interdependence for women's rights of civil, political, social, economic, physical integrity, health and reproductive rights, as in the article that I mentioned on pandemic patriarchy. Um, in the current era, what we are seeing is that nationalist reactions against neoliberal globalization have replaced the former complex of uh, struggles between religious and liberal rights identities. And nationalism has generated a counter frame, a counter movement, and anti-institutional and a liberal forms of what we have this label of lawfare, but it's now also policy fair, right? Like what's happening as I've been uh, learning more right here in Northern Ireland, where now you have a law and you have the health department refusing to implement it, right? These kinds of things are happening in different forms worldwide. Um, so <laughs> we need to go from the red back to the blue, <laughs> expand and strategize our frames, our instruments and interdependence appeals, reaching out to different kinds of coalitions who have interests in maintaining and expanding rights uh, for their own well-being and, and interests and uh, mobilize to defend our institutions and empowerment, um, which I think, well, speaking for myself, I think that uh, some, some of us have uh, perhaps taken for granted or seen as being too thin, uh, but we really need to deepen and expand those democratic, those basic democratic institutions uh, because they do matter when rights are at risk and under threat. Be happy to dig in. I have, as I say, some bonus slides, but I do want to allow at least a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that wonderfully deep and broad, uh, very complex and really fascinating presentation. Um, 
we're in this room. I'm speaking very loudly, even though <laughs> you're just over there, because I realize that we're also online. Yeah. I don't think we have a roving mic unless Roy keeps it, has Mary Poppins bag, but he has missed that. <laughs> so um, I will just speak very loudly and hope that, uh, that uh, everybody can hear it. And um, I guess the most effective way is for since, uh, that you either speak very loudly also, or I repeat the question. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and manage that way. And hopefully um, that will work. Um, so um, any questions from the floor? Roy. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, thank you, Alison, for that um, brilliant synthesis of where we are in terms of reproductive rights. Um, uh, one of the serious challenges facing the world. And I've got a few questions, um, but I wonder if I can just uh, start off with one. Uh, can you just elaborate a bit more on what, why you think Ireland and Argentina went in a different direction? Um, Brazil, Poland, quite a few different factors there, but I'm just wondering, you know, can you say, well, this is what happened here that was different from what happened in Poland, and this is what, if you are interested in the issues of reproductive justice, you need to do differently you know, from what was done in Poland, or for that matter, in the United States. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry for interrupting, but if you could just mini recap the question because you're by the mic so oh the oh oh are... all right all right okay oh so you don't need to do that okay so okay <laughs> <laughs> i thought someone might ask <laughs> uh no in the in the piece you know i this is this is a draft manuscript in case you can't tell i'm sort of halfway through uh, learning about the cases and trying to process the material. Um, so in order to assess whether I thought these really were comparable situations, um, in Argentina and Brazil, uh, they're, they're neighbors and they are often compared. And um, although, uh, and they are, Brazil is obviously much larger, um, but uh, they, they do hover at around similar level of development. Uh, Brazil, as I mentioned, has, uh, has always been more unequal and has become ever more unequal. The Gini index, for those who may not be familiar, is a, an a, a international organization, United Nations kind of index of income inequality within a country, and the higher, the worse, right? Um, uh, democratization, um, you know, sort of the, the, the quality of democracy in a country. Uh, gender equity, um, uh, which is um, surprisingly not that different, but that is measured in part by things like women's labor force participation um, and health outcomes, which in Europe and Latin America by now are, are not that much at issue. And in fact, that's part of the puzzle, right? Women's public rights are expanding across all these cases, or at least stable, and women's private sphere rights are the ones under attack including sometimes, you know, regression on domestic violence issues. Um, I also, uh, the, that index of globalization is just a generic index of how economically connected communications and other, and other factors. Um, fertility rate, because people do make these demographic arguments, and I think there is something going on in Poland. I mean, at least it creates a receptivity to arguments, you know, we're under threat, we need to defend ourselves. So um, um, clearly some things that, that do need to be considered uh, are Ireland, Ireland's tremendously greater GDP, <laughs> although um, uh, I know that Celtic Tiger uh, label is contested, I'm kind of using it as a shorthand, but there really was this remarkable growth spurt um, and along with that tremendous increase in levels of education, levels of women's labor force participation, which are all the modernization factors that are always associated with expansion of democratization and rights. 
um, other things equal. So um, um, we have all of all of that to to look at as far as basic conditions. Um, so what I would say is that these structural um, conditions and factors create the potential for some different political dynamics. I think the story is political dynamics, right? But who is equipped to go in which direction with this? Who is going to turn to different kinds of nationalism or where nationalism is going to resonate in different ways? Um, and who is going to uh, have a more empowered feminist movement and have uh, more motivation and capacity to engage positively with global human rights norms and institutions. And this is where I think, I think so I think it's those two factors, what's happening with nationalism, what's happening uh, you know, inward versus outward, and what's happening with women, women's movements. Um, uh, and um, so I think that, um, in Brazil, the common versus Argentina, well, let's see, should I do it positively or negatively? <laughs> positively in Argentina, um, you have uh, the capacity and incentive to integrate more with global human rights institutions uh, and em empowered women and an empowered, uh, an empowered women's movement and an empowered um, uh, presence in political institutions. That was really critical. Whereas in Brazil, you have, um, frankly, relatively incoherent political institutions. I mean, even if women were empowered, it wouldn't make that much difference in the legislature. Um, and um, you have this um, uh, horrific campaign against the first woman president, Dilma Rousseff, who was impeached under very um, speculative conditions. Um, and you have um, a disempowerment of women's activism, including the assassination recently of some women political candidates and uh, this famous um, uh, Marielle DeFranco, who was a, uh, the first black gay uh, representative of the city council of uh, Rio de Janeiro. So, um, you know, really visible signs of political conflict there and the political empowerment of the evangelical church um, uh, as a counter movement, including that Bolsonaro appointed um, a prominent evangelical woman as the minister of women who um, the ministry has also been renamed to be the ministry of women health and the family um, <laughs> and has adopted um, homophobic mandates you know so it's not just the family it's what kind of family um, so uh, is this the kind of story that that I mean, that you're asking about, I mean, okay. Then going on <laughs> to, uh, to Ireland and Poland. Um, so in Poland, in response to the unexpected costs of uh, European integration for Poland, that, that you know, European integration did not, did not deliver economically the way Poland expected and wanted. And there is still, significant unemployment, underemployment, and critically out migration. Um, and, you know, I mean, brain drain. Um, and the positive association of the Catholic Church as a nationalist resistance to communist force that is maintained and revived through under the auspices of the Law and Justice Party. Um, they serve as a kind of broker um, and um, so the, um, the demographic anxiety, uh, the anti-abortion measures are paired with um, actually, I mean, I, I have to say they are consistent. They do provide extra support to families. They provide, you know, if you have more than two children, you get baby allowances. 
They've increased uh, the time that women can stay home with children um, and um, you know, social policy for families um, to promote. I mean, they genuinely are trying to promote reproduction. Um, in um, uh, the Republic of Ireland, by contrast, um, you do have a steadily empowered women's movement. Uh, you do have a steadily increasing turn to international law and standards um, across all kinds of issues. Um, you do have a political process that allows for increasing levels of civil society influence. Um, um, what? Oh, the um, posit relatively positive influence of the Irish diaspora. So, you know, out migration in Poland is um, contemporary and um, becomes a source of political anxiety, whereas in Ireland it's historic and becomes ultimately a source of positive globalization um, at, this, at this juncture, you know. <laughs> Um, what else can I say? Um, well, and, you know, the level of gender equity uh, across the board in, in Ireland is just, just remarkable. The, the history of women's leadership, um, you know, I mean, Mary Robinson onward, um, she's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, um, so is that kind of <laughs> that's the story that the story that i see um, but if there are other things going on that i'm not aware of again i i'm i'm here to learn uh, as well in exchange any more yes um, again a really interesting talk thank you very much and but i had a question i wanted to ask you to go a bit further into the issue of nationalism since being linked to attitudes um against abortion for example why has somebody who's done so good or racist attitudes to against abortion? Is it because nationalism is patriarchal always? And um, is it because abortion seen as something from far abroad? Well, why is that? And how would you try and counter that with friends? Would you try to keep in touch with that? Yeah. Um, so, um, the kind of historic feminist theory analysis is that um, um, nationalism, historic nationalism, uh, when with the creation of certain kinds of nation states has always also been a population project and historically like authoritarian and fascist regimes in the 20th century uh, were uh, almost always associated with um, you know, control of reproduction, um, most, most famously Nazi Germany. Um, and it, it's not just, it, well, it's regression to more traditional family norms um, and gender roles. It's also, um, it's not always pronatalist, but it is always control of reproduction because sometimes it's this combination of fostering uh, by any means necessary reproduction by majority or dominant or, you know, the right women and blocking reproduction of others through eugenics policies. And in fact, uh, in many nationalist regimes will have both. Um, so there is uh, often a rhetoric and a discourse that we can see particularly in uh, post-conflict situations. Um, and I'm thinking here of the Central American cases that I talked about, of a sense of population loss, fertility panic, um, you know, and um, we're under threat, we're under siege. And um, if it's a nationalist regime, sometimes it, there's a rationality to the policy. If it's a movement, particularly an outsider movement, it's, it's entirely symbolic, um, but there's a sense we're being outbred by our enemies. 
we're being swamped, we're being overwhelmed. Um, so um, uh, the ethno-nationalist and xenophobic attitudes in Europe are very often linked to anti-immigrant political parties and movements, right? And particularly in Eastern and Central Europe. And that's also what I see in the edited volume on populism in my co-authors cases. Um, so, um, you know, it is, it is both um, a, a rational population policy and a completely disconnected rhetorical discourse that is not always rational. Um, and um, that is a symbolic displacement of a sense of threat, loss, emasculation. There is often uh, discourse about feeling disempowered as being emasculated and of the dominant male, formerly patriarchally empowered population losing space um, and that the way to recover this, because we see this not just with reproductive rights, but you know, with other kinds of anti-feminist discourse in, in these movements. And in the US, the white Christian nationalists are just uh, so famously anti-feminist and, and very explicitly link feminism to the loss of racial dominance um, and racial identity. Um, what can we do about it? <laughs> um, um, I think I think that uh, we usually cannot counter these mentalities with a cosmopolitan liberal discourse, and that this has been a strategic error on the part of rights movements. Um, I think that modernizing nationalism um, and uh, demonstrating alternative pathways to self-determination and the legitimate grievances of displaced populations is the way to go and building up interdependencies. And there are gonna be differences in what that looks like in different, you know, depending whether it is a nationally dominant group regime or whether it is an outsider group regime. Um, and, um, and, and I think uh, where there are diasporas or linkages between a nationalist group or movement um, and uh, people from the ethnic community who have experience in some other political system, that that can sometimes be helpful. <laughs>